Welcome to Retina Health for Life from the President's Corner, brought to you by the American Society of Retina Specialists. I'm your host, Dr. Tim Murray, coming to you from Miami. On each episode, we'll bring you inspiring conversations about your sight and the special role the retina plays in making healthy vision possible. We'll hear from expert retina specialists, as well as directly from patients about living life to the fullest with retinal disease. Join us and learn how to safeguard your retina health for life. Hello, welcome to ASRS's Retina Health for Life from the President's Corner. On this episode, we're gonna talk about clinical trials that have ushered in sight-saving advances for many of the diagnoses that have blinded our patients in the past. It's my pleasure to welcome both my colleague and my friend and a fellow retina specialist, Dr. Charlie Wyckoff from Retina Consultants of Houston. Dr. Wyckoff is one of the top authorities on clinical trials in eye care. Dr. Murray, great to be here with you. I remember back in the days, maybe a decade ago when you were training me. So I look forward to this discussion. Clinical trials are absolutely fascinating to me and it's super important that patients understand what the opportunities are. I, I, Charlie, I agree with you. I think that um, you and I both have had a passion for research and we've both been involved in clinical trials, some of which have changed care for, for patients across the nation and around the world. But I do think that you're correct. I think a lot of our patients don't have an understanding of what a clinical trial is and, and have concerns about what participating in a clinical trial could mean for them. I also think it's interesting because with COVID, there's been a lot of talk recently about the vaccine trials and yep. those in some ways are, are similar, but in some ways are, are different from the kind of research that we do. So could you, Charlie, tell me a little bit about um, how you see clinical trials and how you would discuss that conversation with a patient? So first, what is a clinical trial? Yeah, thanks for putting it that way. You know, Tim, I have this conversation with patients every single day. I'm in a busy practice just like you. And as you taught me to do 15 years ago, I try to push the envelope and I try to see what's coming tomorrow. And I love to be able to offer that to patients. And from a patient perspective, the key concept, first of all, is that clinical research is simply medical research involving people. And then when you talk about clinical research, there's really two broad brushstrokes types of studies. There are observational studies and there are clinical trials. And we'll spend most of the time here talking about clinical trials, but it's worth talking about both. So observational studies is kind of what you saw at the beginning with this COVID epidemic, right? We saw what happens with the natural history of COVID. But we still have a lot of diseases in retina and across ophthalmology that we don't really fully understand the disease process itself. And therefore, observational studies are a great way for patients to get involved that do not involve any kind of treatment. They simply help the field and science and researchers like you and me, Tim, and the rest of the community to better understand a disease process. And a great example of that ongoing is called the MACTEL project. There's a retinal disease that's, that's actually more common than generally appreciated called macular telangiectasia. There's no treatment for it, and there's a phenomenal multinational study ongoing that's simply observational, trying to better understand this disease. But of course, if we move into clinical trials, that's really kind of where the heart is, and that's where patients often end up considering participating, right? What is a clinical trial? Well, it's simply a research study involving people aimed at evaluating a medical or surgical intervention. Essentially, it's trying to do better than the current standard of care. Uh, there are some caveats to that, but that, that, that's sort of the broad brushstroke um, thought. And it's critical for patients to understand that before any clinical trial should begin, especially for a new medicine or a new surgical device, typically that treatment has been thoroughly tested in what we call preclinical models. So in laboratory settings, you have an active lab, Tim, you have for years in animal models such as mice and rabbits. And typically those interventions have been thoroughly vetted and have proven to be overall safe with some promise of efficacy in humans. And so once you get to that stage, then you enter the clinical research arena and you enter into clinical trials. 
So Charlie, Dr. Wyckoff, could you take us through sort of the phases of clinical trials? I, I know that for many of our patients, those phase three trials are the ones they hear the most about, but really yeah. for most of these, they've gone through several study phases before they get there. Yeah, yeah, exactly right, Tim. I, you know, the, the, the path to drug delivery and to commercialization and access across the United States for a medication is a very long path. And, and it's almost, you know, it's, it's amazing to watch the COVID landscape unfold. You know, you brought that up at the beginning. I think that's a nice analogy to keep weaving in here because this, the ability to have a potential vaccine commercially available within one year of the, you know, the, of the genomic sequence available for COVID is unbelievable because typically, certainly with all ophthalmic products, the road to commercial availability is, is years, it's decades in many cases. And, and that path has three major steps when it comes to clinical trials, phase one, phase two, and phase three. And we'll just go through each of those briefly. Phase one is typically a small number of patients in retinal diseases. Those patients often have the retinal condition that you're studying, but really the entire goal of a phase one study is to make sure that the medication or the device is going to be safe in humans. You're also maybe looking for a little bit of a signal to see if there's some help in the patients that get it, but the primary objective is safety. Can, can you say, you and I understand what a signal is and why it's important, but for our patients, when we say we're looking for a signal, for example, in, in wet macular degeneration, what's a signal? Yeah, absolutely. So a signal is usually in a phase one or phase two study even an anatomic change. So for example, in wet macular degeneration or in diabetic macular edema or retinal venous occlusive disease, we are looking for the amount of fluid in the retina to decrease because that's one of the key drivers of decreased vision in these patients. You're looking for some signal that there is benefit from the drug and that's typically an anatomic signal in a phase one study. And then once you've sort of proven that there's some level of safety in a small number of patients, and I, I should not use that word proven really, because proven only comes with phase three, but once you have a feeling that there probably is a good safety profile and you're not gonna harm patients, that's always gotta be our number one philosophy. Um, then we move on to phase two in the development process. And phase two is a much larger study, many times an order of magnitude larger. Now you're looking at 100, 200, 300 patients um, typically, where you're using the new medication, we'll focus on medications, not devices here, in a group of patients with the disease that you are trying to treat, and patients typically either receive the medication or receive standard of care. And maybe that's actually no treatment, or maybe that's a different medication. And then again, you're looking for to confirm that patients are not having any safety problems, they're not having any um, challenges come up that you don't want them to, and then secondly, you're now looking more robustly at what is the efficacy signal. When I say efficacy, here we often mean, is there visual acuity improvement? Is there anatomic improvement? Are we seeing benefit from the medication? With the signal from phase two, then there's a move into what's called the phase three trial arena. And Tim, you pointed out beautifully that this is where patients often get involved because these are typically very large multi-center trials. There might be 50 trial sites in some cases, sometimes more across the United States alone, often with dozens of countries around the world also involved because you want to study these new medications in a very diverse set of patients. You don't wanna study just one patient population. You wanna make sure it works in all different types of, of, of people. Um, all of them, of course, with the same disease that you're targeting. Typically these are randomized, meaning that patients either get the new treatment or they don't get the new treatment, they would get standard of care. Um, and often they are what's called double masked, which is very important. It means that the patients don't know if they're receiving the new treatment or if they're receiving standard of care. And also the doctors and the nurses and the support staff that are evaluating the patient also don't know if the patient has gotten the active treatment or the standard of care. And then with the data from phase three, that is what is then used to go to the regulatory agencies in the United States, that's the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration to, to look at the data in great detail. It's a very thorough vetting process. And if it is proven safe and effective beyond standard of care, then oftentimes you'll lead to commercialization of that medication. 
So it's a long process and patients can get involved in every step of the way. I mean, the only way that this research progresses, Tim, is, as you know well and taught me, is by patient participation. And, and, and many patients derive great benefit, personal benefit, and sometimes medical benefit from participating in these studies. And it's worth talking about sort of what are those benefits and risks and who are the type of patients that, that might benefit from these studies. So I, I think that's really, really an excellent summary. But Dr. Wyckoff, when, when our patients look, what, what do you see when you talk to the patients uh, as an advantage for them to participate? And then we'll come back and talk about really what are some of the patient concerns that may push a patient away from participating. So talk a little bit about what's the benefit to being in a clinical trial. Yeah, absolutely. You know, there's, there's, there's a ton, of, dozens of reasons why patients might participate in trials. The three most common scenarios that I come across are, first, patients who simply want to help move the field forward. You know, they want to be a partner in scientific discovery. They want to help advance the field. And this often comes out of a, an experience, a family or a personal experience where a family member had a given disease, let's say a mother or a grandfather had macular generation and, and they watched that process unfold over years before there was good treatment and they really wanna kind of give back to try to advance the field. Or on the flip side, if a patient has kids or grandchildren with a disease that may be partially or fully genetically um, 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 uh, transmitted, maybe they wanna to try to give better options for their kids. So they wanna participate in research to advance the field. The second, and maybe the most obvious, is that many patients participate because there's no treatment option for their disease currently. Standard of care is simply observation. And the classic example there today is, of course, the advanced form of dry macular degeneration geographic atrophy, which is probably the largest unmet need in my clinic daily, where patients are losing vision and we have nothing to offer them. And so patients are often looking for a treatment option. And by participating in these studies, Many patients can find out and potentially get access to these new options of treatment before they're commercially available. And then the third is when treatments currently do exist, for example, diabetic macular edema or wet macular degeneration, but the next generation treatments potentially offer better outcomes or reduce frequencies of treatments, something that's going to improve their long-term outcomes. Those are sort of the three big buckets that I think I would encourage patients to think about why they might, might want to get involved. And then to get to sort of the other heart of the question that you asked, well, what are kind of the, the benefits and risks? It's worth thinking of it that way. There are, there's potential benefits for participating, but as everything in life, there's a potential risk. And I have this conversation very frankly with my patients and that's sort of the silly analogy that I use is driving to the store. Um, you know, there's no, there's nothing in life without a risk. And I drive to the store to get the food because I need to eat. Of course, I use delivery services now a little more than I used to. But <laughs> if we're driving, I'm going to keep driving, even though there is a risk with driving, right? I could get into a car accident, even if I stop at all the stop signs and I drive slowly and I wear my seatbelt, something bad could happen. And it's similar for any medical intervention. And it's particularly true with clinical research. You know, bad things can happen. Every time you give an injection inside the eye, there's a, there's a defined risk of infection with that. And every new medication, we're, of course, studying them for safety and efficacy, both of those things being equally important. And so it's really important that the specific risks of any new therapy are explained very thoroughly, both verbally and in writing, to any, any, any patient that's interested in any new study. And, and that brings me to, to the point that if you are looking at any given particular clinical trial program, and there's many, many to potentially think about, and we'll talk about how to, how to potentially access some of those, but when you're thinking about it, there's a document that you can get at the very beginning that all subjects, patients thinking about a clinical trial um, are given. It's called an ICF or an informed consent form. Um, before you participate, you're given a very large packet of information all about the new medication, about the potential risks, the potential benefits, and the details of the study. Make sure you ask for that when you're thinking about any given clinical trial. So beautiful discussion. So I think that that um, I'm I'm with you for my patients that have a condition for which there's no treatment. Enrolling those patients in a clinical trial has been really easy. 
when there are good or very good treatments, those, those require to me a little bit more discussion and understanding from the patient. But I think that the key for this is understanding what the patient's concerns are. So one of the common questions that, that I get with clinical trials, um, Dr. Wyckoff, is that when the patient looks and says, am I gonna be a guinea pig? Because right. it's, a, it's an experiment. And how do you address that for your patients? Yeah, you know, it's a great question. And I, I, I often tell my patients that I'm blunt, probably too blunt. Um, and they laugh because they know me. And I, I say, yes, you know, I, I truthfully answer that yes, because they are guinea pigs, but they're really not guinea pigs in the way we think about it. But I want them to know that this is a study and we don't know the outcomes of this. And most of the drugs that I study and you study in phase ones don't make it to commercialization because they don't end up working or there's some safety signal. We need to be honest and forthright with that um, from the very beginning as you have in our field has uh, traditionally across the board. Patients need to be aware that these are clinical trials for a reason. There's a reason these drugs aren't commercially available yet. But that said, we are very transparent um, uh, as are I think all clinical trial sites across this country involved with most retina research about what are the real risks and what are the real potential benefits. And then furthermore, patients, I make sure it's very clear that they are going to be you know, cared for as if I am caring for myself or my wife or my daughter or anybody else in my family. They are gonna get the very best possible care that I can give. And if that means taking them out of the clinical study at any time because they're not doing as well as I think they could with a different standard of care, I have no hesitation in doing that. Our job first and foremost is to provide the very best clinical care that we can. And if I think a patient can get better care in a clinical trial, I will absolutely strongly offer that as long as they know that, 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 they, that they have the option, of course, to pull out at any time if that's the right choice. And I also make it very clear that, that there are no business hours, especially when you do clinical research. If there's ever a problem, if patients ever have a concern, they have a phone number that they can call anytime and, and talk to me directly and my team directly um, to make sure that we take care of any problem that develops because you never know what's gonna happen with these new devices and with these medicines. But it's important that patients feel a part of the team, that they know that the physicians and the team are looking out for their best interest. I'm sure we're interested in studying the drug and the scientific integrity is very important and the data is critical, but the patients will always be the most important thing. Yeah, I think that's what's driven some of the best research in the United States is always focused on what's going to be best for the patient. And the other thing I emphasize when it comes down to that assessment of, of, of risk and, and treatment is that in most of the clinical trials, we have a data and safety monitoring group that sits outside of the doctors that are actually directly involved in the trial and patient's data gets looked at by not just the treating physician and the treating physician's team, but usually by a national um, team that overlooks data. So I look at my patients and I say, you think that I look at what, what goes on with you very closely and, and that's something that you and I both pride ourselves with. But now we're having a team of some of the top experts in the country looking at your OCTs and looking at the level of vision and looking at how we're grading the response to treatment. So that's one of those, those benefits that come in that offsets, I think, a lot of that concern about, about the potential risk that's involved and the potential of feeling like you're a guinea pig. That's a great point. And I, I make that point also. I, I definitely say that almost all of these trials are multi-center. So there's excellent centers all over the country and all over the world studying this disease process, studying this given treatment, and that learnings from one site um, are quickly disseminated across all sites within a clinical trial program and that they will benefit from anything we learn at any of these sites. It's a great point. So um, Dr. Wyckoff, can you take us through what a placebo is? Because when a lot of these clinical trials started, the, there was always this question of you're going to get treated or you're going to get the placebo. And most of my patients in a clinical trial want to know what's the placebo. So what yeah. is that? Yeah, I'm so glad you bring it up that way. You know, probably the most important aspect that I think about in any new clinical trial is what is the control arm? Right, because that, that, that's a, first of all, how you define baseline efficacy, baseline safety, and then you compare the new medication or the new treatment to that. So a control arm is essentially the standard of care. 
um, for any given uh, clinical trial. So for example, in geographic atrophy, we'll take a common disease here. There is no treatment. And so the control arm there is no treatment. But you can't do a phase three trial, what's called open label in most cases. Sometimes you do, and there's definitely exceptions to that. But in most, ki most cases, they're masked, as we talked about. So patients in a geographic atrophy study today, there's dozens ongoing, either get the medication or they don't. And the control arm is no medication. It's standard of care. It's observation. But it's critical that patients and people examining the patients to determine outcomes don't know who's getting the active treatment and who's not. And so to do that, you have what's called a sham or a placebo control. And there's subtle differences between those, but essentially they mean the patient is not getting the active treatment. You're right. If I'm in a phase three study, it's not the arm that I want to be in. I'm in the study because I want the active treatment. And it's a, you know, it's sort of a frustrating reality about how these trials really need to be conducted to have good scientific rigor. Um, one of the caveats to that is that many of the trials in geographic atrophy now that are phase three, the, 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 the carrot there and the benefit for patients to do this, even if they're in the sham or the placebo, the control arm, is that once the drug is proven effective at the end of the study, oftentimes there is a crossover. Or there's the ability of that control arm, those placebo patients receiving sham injections to now receive the active medication before it's commercially available. And so patients can often still get access to the real medication, even if they did not get the real medication in the study much earlier than if they did not participate in the phase three trial to begin with. So I think that's really important for patients to understand in a, in a trial where the, there is a treatment arm and a comparator arm where the comparison is no treatment. But I think that what the other thing to understand is for most of the clinical trials for the diseases, we're using what is the state of the art treatment as the control arm. Yes. And I think that's been one of the things that has evolved over time. Um, I think initially, you know, when clinical trials began 40 years ago, people were concerned um, about showing a benefit. So it was always a placebo where there was no treatment. But I think now what we have is where some of the treatments we have are so excellent to begin with that ethically the trial design says, we can't not treat you because that's not appropriate. And those patients get put in a treatment arm, they're randomized to the new treatment or the standard treatment, but the standard treatment may be the best treatment available in the world. So that's that's yeah. a discussion I have with my patients too. I think that's been a big evolution in trial design for, for clinical studies with patients. I love that. Yeah, I love that point. And, and the words that I put out there for patients are superiority and non-inferiority. So for example, in geographic atrophy, where there is no treatment, you're trying to show that your drug works better than nothing. Of course, that, that's what we need to move the field forward. But once we have great treatment, like all of our anti-VEGF agents are fantastic currently. And we have you know, really five of them FDA approved, um, three of them very commonly used. Uh, you know, if we're going to move that field forward with a phase three clinical trial, and there's multiple ongoing looking at new agents in those spaces, BME, a wet MAC degeneration, RVO. The only way to ethically and appropriately do that, as you say, is to have a control arm that is the very best medication today, which um, patients truthfully may or may not be able to get access to if they're not in the clinical trial, even the control arm drug, because these medications are so, so expensive on a, on a regular basis. Um, and those trials are often called non-inferiority because you're trying to achieve the same level of outcomes as the current best medication. Now, maybe you're doing that with fewer injections or some other benefit to the patient, but the goal is for those trials where there's a very good current medication is to at least get as good as the current medication. And if so, they could be approved and hopefully do better. So that's beautiful. The other thing I think patients find some concern with is this concept of randomization. They, it's hard to understand that they don't get to pick which arm they wanna be in and their doctor doesn't get to pick. So I, how, do you, how do you really allow patients to understand why that's, that is what it is and why it has to be that way? Yeah, critical point. You've got to talk about the control arm as you brought up. You've got to talk about randomization and you've got to talk about masking. 
randomization is exactly as you described. When we bring, let's say, a thousand patients into a new study, maybe half of them get the active treatment for geographic atrophy and half get standard of care. And so why can't I pick what I want? Of course, I want the active drug. But of course, the reason we can't do that is it's, it, it's, it needs to be controlled. We need to have a population of patients that, that is going to be the standard of care compared to the new medication. And if we pick certain people to put into that, into the, the active treatment versus the sham arm, there may be differences in who you pick for those different populations. And so you may not know if the drug is working in the way that it should. It's performed the way that it is with randomization so that we can be more definitive about our conclusions about the safety and potential benefit of the medication. Yeah, I, I think that's really important to understand that. One of the things that I'm always impressed with with clinical trials is, is it drives us to really understand the ethics of how we take care of our patients. And, and my patients will look at me and, and they don't want often to be in a clinical trial. They want to get the best treatment. And, yeah. and that brings up that concept that we talk about all the time, this crazy word called equipoise, which is where yeah. we don't know which of these two treatments is better. And, yeah. and if we do know one treatment is better than the other, then ethically, we don't allow our patients to participate in that trial. And the other thing I think that is important is that for all of us, if there's a study design in a clinical trial and it doesn't meet your and my personal physician standards, we don't put our patients in it. So, yeah. so not only do you have a national focus on study design, but you have really the individual physicians being very focused on the best patients to enroll for the study and ability to understand that this is the way to achieve some of the best care in the country. So that's been an important part of that discussion for me also. Yeah. I think that, that those are great points. And I think you know, from a patient perspective, I would tell them to, to get as much information about your disease and about the options for treatment out there if you're thinking about a clinical trial. There are excellent resources out there. You know, the, the NIH, the branch of our, our federal government that sort of oversees um, and directs and funds much clinical research, research has excellent websites. Clinicaltrials.gov is a phenomenal site which sort of summarizes many, if not most of the clinical trials available out there. It doesn't mean that they're all appropriate for you or that they're all supported by the NIH or FDA, but they are, it is a great resource to look up clinical trials. The ASRS itself has a phenomenal website that helps patients get linked to specific retinal um, disease trials. A lot of ways to get information. And if you're thinking about a trial, just as, as you pointed out, Dr. Murray, I would encourage patients to sort of understand what is the current standard of care for that disease state, and then seriously consider clinical trials, um, especially when there's sort of suboptimal current treatment options. And, you know, that brings me to sort of the internet of things, of course. So most of our patients are, are fairly sophisticated and they can look at the internet. And of course, there's so much information there, many, many pieces of information which really haven't been evaluated um, and their sources are uncertain. So what I like to do with patients is I say, you know, bring me the questions you have and let us talk about them so that you understand. And, and that comes up in discussions with stem cell research, mm -hmm. um, retinal transplantation, gene therapy. You know, there's so many exciting things going on, but there's also a, a, a lot of very um, questionable information on the internet mm -hmm outside of the sources that you've alluded to. So yeah. I think that's where the patient has to be an advocate for themselves. And I see our patients doing that more and more, um, really pushing to say, how do I know this is the best care? What about these other studies? What about these other therapies? Do you, are you seeing that in your clinic in, in Houston also? Yeah, I, I really like the way you put that. You know, I think critical that the patients, they do their research, they ask questions, but they've got to bring the questions to the physician. There's unfortunately, there's a lot of phenomenal research out there. And I would encourage almost all patients to consider at least getting involved and find out what your options are. But there is some, you know, work that is called research, which, which, is, which is not supported by the FDA, by the NIH, and is really inappropriate that's happening in our midst. And I 
you know, it's, it's sort of frustrating to even have to talk about that, but you alluded to it. There are sort, there are some, you know, for-profit stem cell, you know, quote unquote research programs for which our field has experienced multiple patients that have been injured by them um, that were not properly governed and were not, did not have proper oversight. So there are, unfortunately, there are organizations that, that do prey on people that want to get involved in research. Um, I hate to be so blunt and kind of negative about it because that is a minority, a small minority of research that's out there, but it does exist. And so patients do need to be careful and they do need to be their own advocate, as you said. And I would strongly encourage patients to take their questions to their doctors, use some of the online resources, but be careful, right? The NIH is very excellent data. Use their, use their websites, ASRS vetted data there also. Now, some of the things to watch out for are you know, for-profit organizations where you're funding your own research. Um, much research out there, not all research, but much research has funding to support it. And so patients can often get access to their clinical trials for, um, for free or for very little uh, money. If you feel like you're paying a lot for research, be careful. Um, again, there are definitely exceptions to that. I'm just trying to give the general guidelines that I discuss with my patients. And then especially be careful with the sort of headlines on the popular news. It's easy to say big brushstroke things when you're on the news and you're trying to get a, you know, attention grabbing sound bites, uh, but the reality may, may be quite different. And I think you brought up a great example, you know, gene therapy and stem cells, there is phenomenal research going on within our field and most fields across medicine. Um, uh, but some of that research is still very early. Now, some of it is becoming later stage, right? We have a FDA approved gene therapy in retinal diseases. And that's extremely exciting. And there's a lot more in later phase human clinical trials. And so we'll be seeing more gene therapy introduced across retina. And so these, these technologies are exciting. They sound like science fiction, but they're real and they're here today. But we do need to be careful about over promising the future uh, because clinical research in most cases takes a long time and we couldn't do it without uh, patient participation, but we need to encourage patients to continue to um, ask a lot of questions before they get involved in any research program. Yeah, I think that's important that they ask questions before, but they also need to know that they, that, that they have a unique relationship with their retinal specialist and they can ask questions throughout the clinical trial. Absolutely. So I think that's really one of the things that, that I find most important. And one of the things that I think you and I have both loved about ophthalmology is that, that ophthalmology really developed sort of the, the form for clinical trials in the United States and really has been a model for clinical trial development. And some of the questions that we've answered have, have just essentially eliminated blindness in some of the patients that we, we take care of. So it's very exciting. And I think that I don't really feel like my patients that have participated throughout the decades in clinical trials with me have been anything but benefited by doing that. Um, but I think that it, it really reflects on the, on the patients that do participate, that they're really giving a part of themselves to give back to others. Um, and, and I find that, that altruism is kind of, you know, it, it's, it's really, it touches your heart when you see that, when people are doing things without really the, the potential always for benefit for themselves. It's inspiring. I agree. I, I, I compl I'm inspired by that every day. And the patients, they spend a long time in our clinics, especially in the pre-COVID era and, and, and the research patients even more so, right? Those research visits for a phase three trial or, you know, in these other studies can be quite long, many hours long. And patients give, they give their time um, and, and, they, and, they, and they're really contributing to advancing science, which is incredibly meaningful. Well, Dr. Wyckoff, thank you for, for joining us at the ASRS um, for this discussion. I, I think that we don't really always focus on, on our teaching to our patients to help educate them and their families. And that's really what we're looking for here. And I think you've done a phenomenal job kind of talking our patients and, and our families through what a clinical trial is and, and what it means to participate and how to know what a good trial is and how to find the right specialist for that trial. So I really would like to thank you for joining us tonight. Tim, my absolute privilege. The ASRS has been a phenomenal resource for me in my training. And now during my career, you've been an incredible mentor for me. Now, it's such a privilege for us to be able to care for patients 
And then just what an honor to be able to participate in advancing the science of our field and to be able to do that as a group of retina specialists across the country, around the world, in collaboration with our patients is, 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 is really exciting. And it's a privilege to be here with you. Thanks for tuning in to Redna Health for Life from the President's Corner. You can watch and listen to more episodes on the ASRS YouTube channel and on popular podcast directories, including Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, and Spotify. For even more information about safeguarding your vision for a lifetime, visit asrs.org slash patients and follow ASRS on both Facebook and Twitter. Retina Health for Life is made possible in part through generous support from the Foundation of the American Society of Retina Specialists, Allergan, Genentech, Novartis, and Regeneron Pharmaceuticals. See you soon.